Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us today uh, for um, this panel that's uh, tracking progress towards financial access, what the latest data from Kenya tell us about the future of financial inclusion. Uh, my name is Jamie Zimmerman, and I run the Global Assets Program here at the New America Foundation, uh, which is uh, the program that houses the Spinnaker Project, which underlies today's event. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Spinnaker. Uh, Spinnaker is uh, a, uh, a sort of rough uh, uh, kind of word for it, the Savings for the Poor Innovation and Knowledge Network. Uh, and this is an ongoing scoping project that we're working on within the Global Assets uh, Program that's aimed at developing a sort of one-stop shop uh, for data, analysis, and engagement of the financial inclusion community around innovation that accelerates the pace of meaningful, effective financial access. Uh, when we got started on this project, with the support of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation a little over a year ago, uh, we were motivi motivated by a couple of different uh, you know, issues that we saw in, in the financial inclusion field. One was a, a real dearth of information and data on savings for the poor. Uh, not only what is working and what's not working, um, but just in general, just, you know, just data out there, um, e not you know, even, you know, to mention the analysis of that data. Uh, systematic data collection on product details, on policies, delivery methods, performance, et cetera, by and large just wasn't happening. Uh, and in many cases, um, you know, the field wasn't doing a really great job of sharing what they were doing, um, the little bit that, that was happening, their insights, their lessons, or their data in any sort of way that allowed for the field to kind of reduce duplication of um, efforts and work, uh, working together more efficiently and more effectively, or even working um, you know, better individually um, by having more communication and better access uh, around data. So Spinnaker was created uh, back in 2010, uh, late 2010, beginning of 2011, as an attempt to uncover how to make the work in this field greater than the sum of its parts uh, and accelerate the pace of innovation towards meaningful financial inclusion. Part of our mission, uh, and we have many different layers um, and uh, objectives with the Spinnaker project, but part of the mission has been to crack this data nut. Um, what data are out there? What's being collected? Where are the gaps? Uh, what can we do with new data if and when we get the data? How can we use them and share them with the field uh, in ways that are useful, meaningful, that add to everyone's individual and collective efforts? Uh, part of this plan to find some of those answers to those questions uh, was a series is to conduct a series of deep dives in specific markets um, that we deemed as innovative or unique or both. Um, which uh, brings us to today's release of the report um, on savings for the poor in Kenya, which hopefully everybody saw outside. Um, you know, there are many copies of it. Grab one. It's also available online for those who are um, watching over webcast. Uh, and uh, this report is written by um, colleagues Anjana Ravi and Eric Tyler, who are in the room today um, and, and will be presenting uh, in just a few minutes. Um, so, you know, this. But not only, this event is not only to release that report, but also to kind of uh, acknowledge that since that time when we started the Spinnaker Project, uh, that there have been a variety of new efforts um, and, you know, and I guess the enrichment of ongoing efforts, um, the few that have been out there, uh, you know, over the last year and a half that are extremely encouraging. Um, there's been a real increase in data-focused projects and more and better visualizations of this data and creating the analytical tools that allow us to understand the data, to parse through, um, parse through them and, uh, and, uh, under and do something meaningful with, with what we have uh, access to. Um, you know, for instance, is you know, the mixed market, um, who has been, I think, a real leader in data collection on financial inclusion, um, if not the leader on data collection and financial inclusion for several years. Uh, and they've started a new mapping series that we'll learn more about today. And then, um, as most of you know, in partnership with Gallup, the global FinDEX database is building upon a new path of openness being forged by and within the World Bank uh, uh, that's allowing for new global comparisons in financial inclusion that is really unparalleled um, by any other sort of data initiative that's out there. 
I know uh, personally that Spinnaker has benefited, benefited from both the mix and the global Findex efforts, and it's exciting for me personally, and, and hopefully for everyone else, um, we'll see, to bring all three of these together, these different initiatives together for the first time to discuss what, we're, uh, what we've been doing and what we found and, uh, and, and have a discussion around that. I also want to just take a minute to say a few words on why uh, we focused on Kenya for our report um, and you know for this event today, uh, and not you know some other country that um, you know this could you know have easily been the topic of conversation. I think that most of everybody in the room uh, is pretty well aware of Kenya's kind of financially inclusive innovations um, and the amazing pace of financial inclusion in the country. I think driven in large part by advances in mobile access and the advent of M-Pesa, as we'll hear, I think, much more about from um, Professor Billy Jack in just a moment. So uh, I won't, don't want to talk too much about why Kenya. I think that that's pretty well established within our field. Um, but the impact of mobile money on financial inclusion efforts, um, the development of products and services, policies and practice across Kenya, I think has really caught the world's attention, um, and not just those of us in the financial services and financial inclusion field, but um, you know the broader uh, data, um, you know, access, broadband, all things open data kind of world, um, uh, and the private sector, and so on. And so I think you know, that's uh, it's a kind of you know, a really amazing example of um, of innovation. Um, Outside of our borders, that, that I think deserves a, a lot of a lot of attention. Um, so, you know, I think that what's been going on in Kenya has raised a number of important questions about the implications of those advances um, on the future of financial inclusion, which is something that we're going to be talking about today. Um, not only within Kenya itself, but just the rest of the world, um, and our you know collective push um, for financial financial access. You know, for instance, one important question that I hear and that I've also asked um, myself, um, is, and that it, you know this comes up relatively frequently, is is Kenyan is Kenya a beacon of hope for our financial inclusion efforts for the field of, of financial inclusion, or is it an irreplicable outlier um, that you know, that we can look at as extremely interesting but can't be um, replicated elsewhere? Uh, and a question that I have for today is, you know, can our latest data efforts that we're all engaged in uh, start us down a path towards answering that question? and deepen our understanding of not only the state of the field, but the shape um, of its future direction and what that direction is. So I hope today's event is an opportunity to explore those questions um, and many um, others that I hope that you and the audience um, here in person and online um, also have on this topic as well. So let's get started. What I'm just going to do really briefly is give a rundown of today's agenda uh, and just a few logistical details just to set the stage for everybody, and then we'll, we'll get rolling with the presentations. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with opening remarks um, from Professor Billy Jack on Kenya's financial inclusion landscape and the recent lessons from his current research on mobile money there. Uh, then Eric uh, and Scott and Leora will present a variety of what we're calling data showcases um, prior to a panel of Q&A, which will be moderated by um, Mireya Almasan from the Gates Foundation. So um, just a note for everybody, for those who want to stick around and talk more about all things data and financial inclusion after the event, uh, we will uh, have an informal offering of wine and beer, and you can hang out and be nerdy together. Um, it's, you know, open for all. Um, but just a few reminders for everybody in the audience. Um, the event is being webcast live. Um, all of our events are. So those watching over webcast or um, those of you who are here in house and like to tweet, um, you can follow the, today's conversation um, over Twitter with the hashtag KenyaData2012, right? Yes, good, I got it right. Um, and for those who are watching online or tweeting, you can also submit questions that you have um, via this Twitter hashtag to the presenters, and we will pass them up um, throughout the Q&A. So feel free to do that um, if you have some burning questions. Uh, having live cast events also means that um, speaking into a microphone is extremely important. So if we're not speaking into a microphone, or if you're not speaking into a microphone, the people who are watching online um, can't hear what's happening. So during the presentations, during Q&A, um, 
you know, please wait for a microphone, identify yourself, keep your question, if you can, brief, um, and, and speak directly into the microphone um, for that. So that's it from me. So let's um, go ahead and get started. I just want to quickly introduce Professor Billy Jack. Professor Jack is the Director of Undergraduate Studies and Associate Professor of Economics at Georgetown University. He, his research covers a, applied and empirical economic theory for development, but his recent focus has been on microfinance and mobile technologies in developing countries. Uh, his unparalleled expertise in cutting-edge research on the Kenyan mobile money market makes him a very popular guy in the financial inclusion world right now, so I'm glad he's able to join us today for this discussion. Billy, come on up. So thanks, Jamie uh, and Eric, for the invitation. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that when you are asked to come and give a talk, you are also asked for a bio, and you try and make it sound, you know, sound good enough that people show up. I just want to assure you that that bit about <laughs> the first half of that was mine, and the second half was hers. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, so it's very, it's great to be here. Thanks a lot for. Uh, inviting me and it's great to see so many nerds shall I say especially with beer and wine to come uh, I think you know the idea that uh, making data or well, collecting data in the first place and then making it available to people is well you know it's the way to truth if you like uh, Sherlock Holmes said you know there's no point in thinking about anything until you just look at the data and then you can figure out what, what to do. So uh, I'm glad to be part of that process. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, the work I've done in Kenya. I, I think this audience is probably uh, too familiar with M-Pesa for me to spend much time on it, but I will you know, share some of the background with you uh, relatively quickly. I think I've got about 10 minutes, is that right? Yeah, so I've used up one already. Uh, so this is a picture of mobile telephony uh, in Kenya. Uh, actually, this is not a picture of mobile telephony. This is a picture of uh, our landlines okay, in Kenya. So from the late 1990s to uh, 2010 or so, there was a slow reduction in the, the uh, prevalence of landlines in Kenya. And but that was offset, or at least uh, in conjunction with a, a spike in the number of uh, mobile subscriptions. So this looks kind of like mobile telephony was catching up to landlines. In fact, if you put them on the same scale, uh, one realizes that uh, landlines are just irrelevant in the developing world. Okay, so the, they've been able to leapfrog, uh, the mobile phones have leapfrogged that uh, fixed line telephony that we all grew up with. Uh, sorry, that, that I grew up with and that some of you didn't grow up with. Uh, <laughs> uh, this, the advent of mobile te technology in uh, Kenya has, you know, made a lot of things possible that were just unthinkable before. So, <coughs> excuse me, one thing that people used to think about in Kenya, which is a country in which families are typically dispersed across a relatively large country with relatively limited infrastructure, was how to get money from one person to another. Uh, so the, typically the way you would do that would be to, to catch a, a bus, a bus being a, a pretty, a, a, a relatively, relatively extravagant term for a, a, some kind of matatu of some kind. And that was a dangerous, slow, costly uh, process in order to get money home. So instead of that, M-Pesa provided a solution which was revolutionary, utterly revolutionary, by orders of magnitude, okay, by which money could be somehow miraculously sent home. I remember when I first started uh, looking at M-Pesa, it was when I lived there, I, I, you know, everyone was trying to think, well, how does the money actually get into the phone, you know, and it somehow gets, and in which, you know, pictures of like, you know, of this didn't really do much to help people understand because it really looks like you're putting money into your phone somehow and going over the airwaves. Uh, this uh, effectively transformed people's lives, or, although uh, I should say, it, it, it seems like it's transformed people's lives. So I think the, the benefit of having data can allow us to see exactly how people's lives have been changed and how much they've been changed, and whether there's any r reason that governments should be interested in this, whether that, this can be left to the private sector, etc. So to give you a very brief and I'm sure uh, somewhat 
um, unnecessary overview. The Impesa concept is that it's just a, it's an accounting device. Uh, there's a computer somewhere in uh, Safaricom headquarters or maybe in Vodafone headquarters in the UK, which has a list of accounts and uh, you can just communicate that with you uh, via your cell phone uh, through SMS technology. The important thing and the more important thing than the technology is the prevalence of these so-called uh, Impesa agents, which are these um, cash in and cash out uh, uh, agents that are around the country. Think of these as ATMs, but uh, with legs and people who can talk. Okay, so uh, this is a little bit old, this this particular graph, but um, up until 2011, there was an increase uh, in the number of users of M-Pesa, the uh, blue line, uh, which was matched more or less by the number of agents. Obvi obviously, they're on different scales, but uh, the increase in customers was matched by an increase in agents that was really extraordinary. So currently, we are at about 35,000 functioning agents in the country. This is a country with about 1,200 bank branches, or so maybe a little bit more by now. Okay, so as I said, orders of magnitude uh, deeper penetration of this financial service. So uh, to give you some idea about uh, the, the growth of these a this agent network, let me remind you where Kenya is to start with, <laughs> uh, and then show you uh, the growth of the agent network. So we actually did a survey of, of agents uh, and asked them when they were formed. So from that, over a period of three years, we could tell, uh, we could map the growth of these things. Now, this is going to be nothing compared to the visuals that uh, the other speakers will present you with. That's why they put me first. <laughs> so it was kind of a you know, ramp up. Uh, but, but <laughs> so starting in June of 2007, which was only a few months after M-Pesa had started, uh, these little blue dots tell you where the agents were. And by the way, this is, this first graph is actually very useful. It shows you that if you're going to start one of these businesses, the last thing you want to do is put all the agents in one place. You have to put them everywhere to start with, and then you've got a chance of moving, which means that there's a huge fixed cost associated with setting up any kind of network like this. Which is, and also, and that's reflecting the fact that uh, M-Pesa didn't make any money or made losses for the first few years of its uh, operation. Anyway, over time, in six months of the intervals, we can see the, the growth of this uh, network of agents up until 2009, uh, so it's been growing even more. But it's been, uh, effectively, the agents haven't been spreading out, they've just been getting deeper everywhere, okay, which has increased people's access to them remarkably. Okay. So why was it so popular? I think the, this is uh, old news. It was the customer's idea. How do I know that? Well, they were doing this already. Uh, as you know, in the developing world, most uh, all telephone, uh, cell phone uh, calls are made on a prepaid basis. And once you get credit on your phone, you can send that to someone else. And so people would typically do that. They'd send credit to someone up country. That person would then sell it to someone else nearby, thereby uh, uh, affecting a financial transfer. Uh, the prepaid airtime had generated a lot of trust. People would say, you know, people must trust uh, Safaricom a lot to be, give them their money and hope to get it back. Well, they were doing that already when they gave them their man money and hoped to make a telephone call in the next, you know, few days. So that wasn't a big deal. Uh, accessibility, again, as I said, there's 50 times or more the number of uh, uh, agents as compared to bank branches. It's really easy to sign up. Uh, it's cheap, convenient, and safe. Okay, so it's, it's uh, great. Uh, there's no comparison with what was before, okay? So if you were in Nairobi and wanted to, to sell, uh, send some money out to Kisumu on Lake Victoria, how would you do that? There's two ways, the old way and the new way. And the old way, if you kind of do a little bit of accounting, uh, turns out that you spend more than half of the money you're trying to send on sending it. And the new way, you spend like nothing. Now, there are other means of sending money as well, so, uh, Western Union, etc., and some of those other means have tried to uh, match Safaricom's prices. Uh, the, but the, the ubiquity and density of the network of users means that it's very difficult for other uh, operations to catch up. So our survey, the, to come to the uh, topic of today's meeting uh, about data, uh, when I say our, I really mean her survey. Uh, my colleague Tavneet Suri at MIT uh, the Sloan School of Management has been uh, deeply, and I mean up to her eyeballs, in this, uh, this project for the last four years, um, was of 3,000 households across most of Kenya. We left out a couple of places in the northern remote areas because at the time we started in 2008, there was no, uh, virtually no uh, cell phone towers and certainly very few um, M-Pesa agents up there. Uh, and mo very few people yeah, actually lived up there. And there were four rounds of this over the four years from 2008 to 2011. And these red dots show you where our, 
the households we talked to lived. <coughs> I'm not going to go through all of the data, but just in, on the subject of financial inclusion, uh, who's using m -Pesa? So it turned out in 2008, you know, uh, the idea of this was going to be banking for the poor and banking for the unbanked. And what happened? Well, it turned out that in the, in the early days, um, many more people uh, used it who were relatively well off compared to relatively not so well off. In fact, the blue line is people on uh, $2 a day or more. <laughs> it's not a lot. Uh, the, the green line is uh, $1.25 a day. Okay, so comparing these, the you know the better off guys were 2.7 times as likely to use it as the lower guys. But that gap has uh, narrowed over time. I don't really care about the gap. It's the fact that the green line is increasing so rapidly, up to nearly 75% now. That I think is important. So three quarters of uh, people who are really near the bottom of the pyramid uh, using this service or have access to it. Similarly, for the bank versus the unbanked, if you look at uh, people who have bank accounts are the red guys, people without bank accounts are the blue guys, it turns out that uh, this wasn't originally a, a service for the unbanked. More, more people with bank accounts used it than with, without. But again, by the time uh, we get to 2011, oops, uh, where up to 75% of the population who hasn't, hasn't, doesn't have a bank account is using m -Pesa. So I think there's a real sense in which this is including people in, uh, in, in the financial system. Uh, what does it do for people? I mean, there, there's an obvious, obviously we hope it makes them better off. One indicator of that is just the use. It's not free, right? So that's a good sign that it's actually useful. If it was free, then lots of people might have it and it may still be pretty useless. But because they're paying for it, there's a revealed preference there that it actually does something to, for them. Uh, how much does it make them richer? I don't know. That's really hard to tell. It's very hard to tell. The one thing we've been able to find from our uh, econometric work is that it, it effectively provides individuals with insurance or it, allow, it allows them to more efficiently insure themselves through informal networks. Okay, so we do a lot of fancy footwork uh, econometrically to show that basically people without access to m -Pesa, when they suffer some kind of shock, on average their, income, their consumption goes down by 7%, but if you have m -Pesa or have access to it, then you don't see a reduction in your consumption following such a shock. Okay, so people use this as a means of expanding the, the size and the, the scope of their network of, of people who can help them basically. Uh, and, um, and that's a real benefit, a real quantifiable benefit of m -Pesa. So I'll finish with uh, just a note on what comes next. I think uh, certainly what comes next and what is happening now, uh, transactional services I think are important. If we want to include poor people in the financial system, what does that mean? It means allowing them to do everything that we do without even thinking, okay? So paying things, paying for things, bill payment. So uh, urban electricity and water, et cetera, that's you know, stuff that I used to buy when I lived in Nairobi, that's not really relevant for the poor. But things like a user fees, for rural water systems, there's a rural water system in Kenya that now that you can pay using M-Pesa. Turns out to be a great idea because the less money there is floating around and getting kind of stolen, uh, the more likely this system is going to be to be uh, maintained and sustainable into the long term. Uh, my current <laughs> topic of interest is one that's not mentioned in polite company, but uh, <laughs> slum toilets basically. How are you going to make them sustainable? How do you, you know, to make them sustainable, you've got to get people paying for them. A little amount, a tiny amount, but we all use them enough that a small amount can go a long way. Uh, personal finance, school, pee, school fee uh, prepayment. Uh, that's kind of savings, but we don't like to call it savings with M-Pesa because it's not meant to be a savings product. Uh, savings go for uh, in the health sector. I'm working with a group now looking at helping uh, women, pregnant women, save for their deliveries. A uh, very definable event uh, that's going to happen in nine months and using some kind of mobile device to, to save for that is uh, potentially useful. Uh, microfinance and business services as well. Microenterprise credit, trade credit, other kinds of microfinance. So I'll stop there. That's where the kind of stuff we're doing, and I look forward to learning about uh, what everyone else is doing. Thanks. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Billy. Um, it's going to be. I think um, I'm interested and intrigued to see, you know, whether the the new data and the maps that have been created um, by Mix and the World Bank and and here within uh, Spinnaker. Um, 
corroborate or challenge you know, some of the, the things that you're seeing in the analysis that you've been doing. So we're going to do our showcases now, um, or quick data showcases, and I'm just going to really quickly introduce um, each of the different, all th our three different showcase presenters, um, but each will come up individually and, uh, and present so that they're not blocking the view here. So the first up is Eric Tyler, who's a program associate here at New America with our Global Assets Program, where he's conducting the research writing and um, advocacy on all kinds of topics, but mostly at the intersection of uh, technology, emerging economies, and economic development. Um, but uh, I'd like to think that he's focusing like 150% of his time solely to Spinnaker, <laughs> but he does a lot more than that too, so, um, and, uh, and successfully as well. He's spearheaded a lot of our uh, research and deep dive efforts, um, as well as our data visualization efforts. So the report that you'll see, the data that's coming out of it, um, all of that is uh, a product of his work and, um, and something that I'm very grateful for. Uh, next up is Scott Gall, who doesn't work for me, so I'm not going to say as nice things about him. Um, just kidding. I will. I'll try. Um, he's the director of analysis at the Mixed Market, where he's managing the production design and, um, and innovation of analysis products for Mix, along with leading Mix's industry research efforts. Um, in addition, at Mix, Scott researches data uh, supply chain innovations that serve Mix's mission and audience needs. And then our third showcase um, and final showcase presenter will be Leora Clapper uh, from the Global Findex Initiative at the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Clapper is a lead economist in the finance and private sector research team in the development research group at the World Bank where she currently focuses on entrepreneurship, household finance, and measurements of financial inclusion, including this um, uh, Findex database. Um, so uh, the panel afterwards that, uh, and I'll just go ahead and, and, and introduce this part, um, we'll, that will open up for Q&A will also include Professor Jack and will be moderated by Mireya Almasan and I'll just take an opportunity to introduce her as well. She's a program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, in their financial services for the poor team. And uh, the Gates Foundation supports uh, much of the work that's being highlighted today, if not all of it, I'm not totally sure. Um, but Maria personally has a keen interest um, and expertise and understanding um, of Kenya and the East, and East Africa market uh, more broadly. And uh, since part of her role at the Gates Foundation is to draw lessons from the field to inform the foundation's strategic priorities, I suspect she'll have several pressing questions um, for our panelists after seeing their showcases um, to, uh, uh, to that point. So prior to joining the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Maria uh, did a, a span of global work um, from South Africa to Nicaragua and everywhere in between. So we're grateful to take advantage of her uh, trip to DC to tap into her expertise um, to enrich and enliven today's discussion. So um, uh, now that the introductions are all out of the way, and um, we can move more quickly through all the more fun stuff. Um, and so Eric, come on up and get started. Um, I'm excited to have a couple minutes to uh, share some insights and analysis from the data that we collected a couple months back in Kenya. Uh, before I jump into the data page that we've been putting together over the past couple weeks, I'm going to quickly touch upon uh, the data philosophy that we have as part of the Spinnaker project. Um, in many ways, uh, the concept behind Spinnaker is similar to the concept behind uh, the original Sears catalog. The original Sears catalog was meant to showcase and share information on the latest and most cutting edge uh, household products. Spinnaker is, more, is focused not on household products, but financial products, and specifically uh, saving products that are available and targeting the poor. Um, and one of, as many as Billy Jack was mentioning, one of the uh, contexts and landscapes that we were really interested in pursuing and capturing was uh, Kenya. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into um, the data page. That looks like, ah, great. Um, and so we collected data on over 100 different saving products across Kenya. And one of the things that we were immediately struck by was the wide range of different financial institutions that were engaged in this space. So you have the traditional players like commercial banks, uh, like microfinance, microfinance institutions, state-owned banks, postal banks. Uh, but then you also increasingly see a lot of technology startups in this space, uh, insurance providers and asset management companies that are increasingly engaged in this space in driving competition uh, even to the bottom of the pyramid. 
Um, this is, as an example of this, these are three products that are targeting women in Kenya that are taken directly from the Spinnaker website and the data that we collected in Kenya. And the institutions cannot be more different. Uh, the first institution is Kenya Women Finance Trust. It's a microfinance institution that's based in Kenya. And one of, the, one of the most interesting things about their product has to do with their pricing. So meaning that their pricing, uh, the minimum opening deposit of their account is zero. So you can start savings with as little as 10 Kenya shillings or 10 cents. Um, this compared to the Changa Manka maternity card, uh, Changa Manka Micro Health is a technology startup that is developing a smart card technology so women can build up sums of money towards maternal health goals like um, giving birth or something along those lines. And the third, the third institution that we have displayed here is INM Bank. And INM Bank uh, is really focused more on the advertising and dissemination efforts. They utilize a wide range from mobile messages to billboards to emails to market and create a value proposition with their customers. Um, I'm going to now jump to, as Billy Jack touched upon, uh, I would be remiss without talking a little bit about how technology has completely or relatively completely transformed the delivery and access to uh, financial services in Kenya. And Right now, I've looked at, in the past four years, uh, three different um, access points. Microfinance branches, uh, commercial bank branches, and ATMs. But when you compare this to bank agents, so in 2010, um, the Central Bank of Kenya opened up regulation that allowed for agent banking. So pretty much, it allowed commercial banks to outsource certain financial activities um, to retail shops. So think um, grocery stores, think gas stations. And in one year, there's over 8,000 agent banks or banking agents that were spread out across Kenya. However, if you compare bank agents to mobile money agents, again, you see this number is dwarfed. So there's a huge mobile money agent network that's grown across Kenya. And what's even really interesting, if you look at the first year of growth of bank agents compared to the first year growth of mobile money agents, the bank agents actually grew at a faster rate. During the research, uh, the Central Bank of Kenya also opened up um, regulatory methods, uh, regula regula regulatory, uh, excuse me, regulation around agent banking to microfinance institutions, and I think we're increasingly going to see a lot of movement in this space. And this, these trends in technology were also seen in our data. 75% of the institutions we say, we surveyed offered one or more of their of one or more of their saving products via mo a mobile phone. Um, the third really interesting data story that we saw was involving commercial banks. Um, I'm gonna, this is a flow chart that tracks uh, each one of these circles represent a different commercial bank in Kenya. And the, the size of the dot corresponds to the volume of deposits. So as the volume of deposits grow, the dot of each of these banks will grow. Um, and as you can see, there's a handful of different players that are really successful in uh, mobilizing volume of deposits. Uh, Kenya Commercial Bank is a, is a pioneer in this space, Equity Bank, um, and also Cooperative Bank of Kenya. Um, I think even more interesting is when you take a look at um, the number of deposit accounts. So these are the same commercial banks, in the, in, except for this time, the dot corresponds to the number of deposit accounts at each one of these institutions. And what you see is one institution, Equity Bank, really pioneering and having being successful in this space. Um, and then towards in the more recent years, you also see uh, Kenya Commercial Bank mobilizing a lot of deposit accounts as well. Um, if you take a closer look at this data, it, really, it tells a really interesting story. And um, in the past, since 2006, Equity Bank has, has um, created over 4.4 new deposit accounts. 97% of these have a volume of deposits below 100,000 Kenya shillings, the equivalent of 1,000 US dollars. Uh, Kenya Commercial Bank tells a similar story. The, um, the majority of these counts are below 100,000 100, shillings, excuse me. And if you look at the social mandate and the mission statement of these two, of Equity Bank and KCB, you'll see a, you'll see a different story. Um, Equity Bank has a social mandate at its heart, inclusive customer-focused financial services that socially and economically empower clients. Kenya Commercial Bank, it doesn't mention anything about it. It doesn't incorporate or integrate a social mandate into um, its mission statement. It's called, it says, to be, the preferred, to be the preferred financial solutions provider in Africa with a global reach by 2013. So these were three, re these were three uh, interesting and unique insights to the Kenya context, but we invite you to explore all the data that we've made publicly available on the Spinnaker website. 
um, and compare and visualize and come up with your own data stories. Thank you so much. I'm just going to bring up Scott. Okay, great. And um, next up is Scott Gall from the Mixed Market. He's going to showcase the uh, Mix's Kenya Financial Inclusion Data Map, which compiles a range of Kenya-focused data sets, including Mix's, Finscope data, Spinnaker data, um, among a, a, a number of data sets. So um, come on up. Great, so thanks to everyone for coming. Do I run this from here? Is this? You got it. Awesome. <clears throat> thanks, everyone, for coming and uh, for Spinnaker and New America for hosting us today. Um, so I'm going to talk about a little project that we've been working on for the past few months, which happens to focus on Kenya, but this is something that we think also um, would work and could be done in other markets, and so I'll talk a little bit um, about that as well. Uh, so we can go to the first slide. Do I do it? Oh, okay. Oh, this. Got it. Um, so this is kind of our motivation. So why why would we look at data on financial inclusion? Why would we want to um, bother to go through the effort to pull together this kind of a resource? Um, so this is, for those of you that have read or um, at least familiar with Portfolios of the Poor, this is the balance sheet for two of their clients there in Bangladesh. Um, but uh, the story is basically the same, that the poor have very sophisticated and diverse financial lives. They've got a lot of different services through different channels, through different types of institutions. Um, so we're learning a lot more about the lives of those clients through this work, and I think the work that Lura is going to um, show in a few minutes. Um, but what we wanted to do was figure out who's on the other end of these transactions. So if they're, they're, they're a client of a microfinance institution or of a bank, what's the, the counterparty for um, this person? What's the, who's providing services to Hamid and Khadija? Um, and learn a little bit more about their activities and their footprint so that we get a read on um, who's providing and who could provide financial services to the poor. Other way. Great. Um, so we've been pulling together uh, mapping efforts in a couple of different sectors, and we've worked on Sub-Saharan Africa um, for the past several months um, through the generous partnership of the MasterCard Foundation. Um, and we've been we've gone through South Africa, Rwanda, and Kenya. We picked three markets that we thought were sort of of interest and had different characteristics. So at a high level, you can pull the information together and get a read on how do these sectors um, differ from each other, where are they similar. There's components that are all shared. They all have banks. They all have microfinance institutions. They all have cooperatives. They have them with different um, frequency, and they're kind of different flavors. Um, in each country, uh, but you also want to see how they differ. So we have something like M-Pesa agents with very high penetration rate in Kenya. Uh, we have non-bank providers in South Africa with what's a, per capita sort of an even higher penetration rate. So per person, there are more uh, non-bank uh, credit providers in South Africa than there are M-Pesa agents in, in, that we know of in um, Kenya, uh, which seems hard to fathom. Um, but uh, so we get a little sort of high level view of the structure of each sector. Um, and that's useful, but we want to take this beyond just saying a lump of banks or a lump of cooperatives to figuring out what those individual institutions are like and learn a little bit more about the story behind uh, who they are and what types of services they either do or, or could provide. I keep clicking the wrong way. Um, so what we've been doing is focusing on mapping. Mapping is a way to kind of uh, visualize this information, to make it publicly accessible, and to unpack some parts of the story uh, behind this data. So we've been working um, now on Kenya. Um, this should be active now. Um, we have some of our colleagues from Development Seed um, who have been helping us to put these maps together in the audience. Um, and Kenya, we've taken a more collaborative approach than, than in some of the other markets because there's so much attention and so much intensity focused here that there's actually a lot of data, but it's sitting in, you know, sort of different, everybody's got a little sliver of the world that they know a lot about, but we haven't seen where it's all been pulled together. So we've got data on the savings products that, um, that Eric and um, the Spinnaker team have helped um, open up access to um, FSD Kenya and the Central Bank of Kenya map bank branches a little couple years ago, um, but still... Um, of use. The World Savings Bank Institute is on a project working with the branches for the Postal Savings Bank and agents. Um, uh, we work with microfinance institutions, WOKU, their countries to have help open up um, data on the 4,000 credit unions um, that operate in Kenya. Uh, we're using data on demand surveys at a province level from FinScopes that were run there. Um, so we're trying to pull all this data together so you can get a pretty big holistic view. And it's something close to recreating the, the set of counterparties that are on that balance sheet that we talked about at the beginning. 
Um, we're using some things that are kind of cool, I think, uh, for the nerds in the audience uh, about getting the data together and, and getting access. So if you want to talk to um, us about that, uh, me about that with over a beer, uh, I'd be more than happy to. Um, and there's a couple other countries uh, that are up now um, as well, so you can get a different view of this Jiminy Christmas. Um, great. So one of the things that's nice when people release and share data is you find little nuggets of information in it that um, um, are potentially of interest. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that we saw in data on the bank branches and data on the cooperative sector um, and on microfinance institution is something about that when these branches are established, when that sort of um, reach went into different parts of the country. So um, this is the last 100, 110 years of the financial sector development in Kenya. Um, and you can see uh, there's pretty rapid change. This is the branch footprint. This is bricks and mortar, so they've got a building. Uh, this isn't just the agent banking picture. Um, so if you roll back and we look at sort of within our lifetime, if you were born in 1960s, you know, 50 years or so ago, um, you would have seen there be banks and cooperatives in some parts of the country, not that many, kind of about the same number um, uh, across the country as a whole. Uh, but within the last 50 years or so, there's really been a sea change in the sector. Um, and we see that there's about eight times as many bank branches as there were 50 years ago. There's about 30 times as many cooperatives, though. So uh, we may look and our lens is very clear on banks globally, um, but this, this cooperative sector has had, you know, multiple, um, much more reach uh, in different parts of Kenya. Uh, over the past 50 years over a long period of time than bank branches. And if you paid attention in the last 10 years or so, you'd have seen this little trickle at the edge of microfinance institutions, almost getting up to where bank branches are um, today, but you know, fairly rapid growth, but really within um, this long span, um, a fairly short time horizon. I'm not going to get that by the end of the presentation. Um, so this is the same graph uh, with agent banking captured into it. So we've got the from zero to the best data we could find was 28,000. Now it's 35,000. Um, there are a lot of agents in uh, South, and sorry, not in Ken South Africa, in Kenya. Um, there is a little sliver down there for agents through the post bank, uh, who also have an agent banking system. And I know um, Eric had some of the data on the rest of the banking sector. Um, so when you look at what looked like a sea change from having you know a very thin sliver of banks and cooperatives 50 years ago to today, uh, and you lay the agent banking change onto that, it's really um, incredible. And I think this is what opens up questions for us about what the long-term development of the financial sector would be like, what, we, what could we anticipate, you know, where would um, agent banking go, what haven't they reached in the country, what services aren't they providing. And so when you see this type of growth, uh, uh, that's the thing I th that for me provokes a lot of questions. Growth is something that within microfinance sectors attract a lot of um, interest. And so that's what we're going to look at. So we're going to look at what the footprint of these institutions is. And so when you get good granular geographic information, you can utilize other good granular geographic information to kind of um, put that into context. So we took poverty data um, that the government of Kenya through their open data initiative has been uh, wonderful in making publicly available. And we plotted that at a district level by the different um, channels and types of institutions. So there's about 70 different districts. Um, and this breaks out each different channel um, plotted against the total population and then the number of poor um, in each. And so what you can see um, the short version on this basically is that you see the different reach of each type of channel. So there's more M-Pesa, then there are cooperatives, then there are banks, et cetera. That's the scale. Um, and if you look at the slope, um, the slope is actually pretty similar for each of them. So they are as likely to be located in poor or affluent areas as each other. So if um, you might expect maybe banks are more likely to be located in affluent areas than microfinance institutions, something like that. This is at a district level. Um, and then the slopes would be uh, different for the lines. There's nothing counterintuitive here, but again, you want to have the data and look at it to sort of um, get a read on those questions. Then we're hoping to be able to take this one step further, and this is where the uh, collaboration with Spinnaker has been really productive. So they have really good product data, um, and now we've got pretty good data on locations for different types of institutions providing those products. So you can, as the kids call it, mash those up and get a little read on how the landscape for financial services, you can get this sort of surface map of the country um, looking not at a, just a, the infrastructure, the footprint, but really on a cost basis and uh, the attributes of those products. So what are those, uh, what if someone is going to look for a savings product in town X, what are they likely to find? And so you can see where there's high fees for opening fees, high fees for inactivity. Um, these are mapped using the exact same data that, um, that Eric is talking about. Um, you can look at it by district. Again, there's 70, so this is kind of like unwieldy here. But this is um, now uh, data that's basically publicly accessible. This took about five minutes of work to do using some of the tools that are out there. So this is the kind of thing where we can't answer all of the questions, but uh, having the data available makes it easier for other people to answer questions. So 
we have here a big list of questions that are unanswered, at least based on the, the slides today, but I want to provoke uh, people to think about what else you could do with the fact that this data is available so it doesn't just kind of sit in a box and we all get to um, have a, a shiny report that we're very happy with, but it has to do something after that. So I'm sorry for running over. That's, that's it. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to present what we think is very exciting data um, that was launched last month at the World Bank IMF spring meetings. And so we know that financial inclusion allows adults to smooth their consumption and to insure themselves against the many economic uncertainties that they face, from illness to accidents to theft to unemployment. Financial inclusion also allows the poor to save and to borrow, to invest in economic entrepreneurial opportunities, to invest in education, and to save for the future. And so, however, we had no metrics of financial inclusion, no metrics of the percentage of adults who are banked, who save, who borrow. And so the goal of this project is to collect comparable data using consistent methodology, consistent questions around the world, which was quite an ambitious um, undertaking. And so with, uh, with uh, generous funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, we partnered with the Gallup World Poll Survey, which since 2005 has been surveying at least 1,000 individuals in up to 150 countries per year. And so again, using consistent methodology, interviewers are trained consistently around the world, and we use identical questions placed identically in every survey in every country. And so the goal is really to collect data on how adults, how the around the world save, borrow, make payments, and manage their risk. And so what's special and new about this uh, data um, is that it's collected from the perspective of the individual. And we're very careful, as I'll discuss in the next few slides, um, to ask about ownership of the account. Do you, yourself or jointly with someone else, can you deposit into or can you withdraw from the account? Which really allows us to get at the questions of economic empowerment of women, of youth, of the poor. Um, and so, as mentioned, so here's an example of the rigorous uh, survey methodology. Um, sorry, it's not so clear. So the red uh, Gallup surveys by selecting first six population strata. Within each strata, they collect um, hundreds of PSU-specific zip codes, blocks, or villages, where they then randomly select um, households and individuals based on the Kirsch grid. Kish grid. Um, and so here's our headline uh, indicator and map, uh, financial, the percentage of the banked, of those having an account at any regulated institution, a bank, cooperative, post office, microfinance institution um, around the world. We find that 41% of adults in developing countries relative to 89% of adults in high income countries are banked, including 24% of adults in sub-Saharan Africa. We also find that over two and a half billion adults uh, do not have an account. What I mentioned before, we're also able to splice the data by demographics. So for example, we find um, that the, those adults who are in the top 20% of earners within countries are more than twice as likely to have an account as the bottom 20% of earners. We also find persistent gender gaps. Interestingly, we don't find in high income countries been developing countries across all income categories, we find a persistent gender gap. So for example, even within the top 20% of earners in developing countries, we find a persistent nine percentage point gap between men and women in financial inclusion. Um, we could also look at more objective measures of poverty. And so for example, we find that over 75% of those living at under $2 a day um, have a formal account. So here we have the data spliced by region. Um, there's a necessary caveat about the Middle East that's a, a more limited sample because of the uh, political difficulties last year in surveying in the region. However, we find that financial inclusion in Africa is relatively low. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the uniqueness of this data, we can splice and dice the data by individual characteristics. So I put up some examples in Kenya. So not only do we have measurement that 42% of adults are banked, we could dig deeper, identify who is the unbanked. So for example, we again see this persistent gender gap, 46% of men versus 39% of women. We find a strong gap between rural and urban residents, 
likely reflection of penetration, of bank penetration in uh, rural regions. We also find a very strong uh, income uh, gap. 19% of the lowest 40% of earners versus 85% of the highest uh, top 20% of earners. And so we also, and I, I apologize because of time, I encourage you to read our report. I'm leaving a lot of juicy details. We also ask about the modes of access, ways that you, depo you deposit into and draw from your account. Um, we also ask questions on um, the frequency, how many times per month you deposit and withdrawal. Um, so for example, we identified that almost 200 million adults around the world have zero deposits into or withdrawals from their account in a typical month. Um, we also are interested in how you use your account. Is it enough that your employer sets up an account for you so, or, uh, government, uh, or for government payments, but whether you also use your account to save or to send remittances, for example. So here, um, for example, we're showing um, the use of accounts for family remittances to send or receive money. And find that 38% of account holders in Sub-Saharan Africa use their accounts to receive money from family members living elsewhere. Um, and then I break it down for Kenya as well. Um, a, the largest use, uh, reported use of accounts is to send or receive, to actually to receive money from family living elsewhere, and only 12% of account holders use their accounts to receive government payments. And so this, I think, is perhaps uh, one of the most interesting um, data from our database. And so again, it's one thing that people have an account. In Eastern Europe and Central Asia, for example, Many people have an account that's established for them by employers to receive wage payments or the government to receive government payments. But it's another thing for people to have the trust and confidence, the confidence that the government isn't going to expropriate their money, that the bank isn't going to steal their money, and actually use their, the bank to save. And so we find that 17%, and so here's the distribution. We have the formal being that uh, gray category, the uh, shadow being um, uh, community-based and formal on the bottom being community-based only. And um, that includes, for example, Roscas in Africa, um, where people make regular payments and receive the money on a rotating basis. And so interestingly, we find that 17% of savers in the developing world use a form of community-based saving, although it's 48% of savers in Kenya use this form of Rosca. Um, and so certainly the, pop the high usage speaks to its popularity, but there's, this, the, there's also the high risk of theft and fraud. You know, we hear anecdotally that people belong to five Roscas because the first four are going to steal their money. And so again, this may highlight the need for safer products. This may be a market, um, the people who are able to commit to regular payments, that may be a missing market uh, for the formal sector. And so I certainly couldn't uh, not show you a map of mobile banking penetration when we're talking about Kenya. So um, we also ask whether you use your mobile phone to send or receive money or to make uh, pay bills or make payments. And so we find that 16% of adults in Sub-Saharan Africa use a mobile phone to pay bills and receive money or s send or receive money in the past 12 months. Um, it's clearly much higher, the highest usage in the world of mobile technology, I'm sorry, the developing world, is that 68% of adults in Kenya use this mobile technology driven certainly by the early success of M-Pesa. Um, however, it's interesting to note that 40, as has been discussed earlier, 42, I, I think our data is roughly consistent, the 42% of adults, 41% in Kenya, that use a mobile technology are otherwise unbanked, suggesting that at this point, uh, mobile technology is often being used as a substitute for formal banking services. And so finally, I'll show some additional data. Um, this data was collected by Jake Kendall from the Gates Foundation. Um, so we added two-hour data to the Gallup World Poll Survey in 11 countries, additional detailed questions on how, well, uh, um, among other things, how explicitly how money is sent and received. And so I think this picture is quite striking, um, how different Kenya is from the rest of Africa. And you know, certainly an interesting discussion is how and if the rest of Africa can or should catch up. And so we see here that what it was the method used to uh, send largest domestic remittance payments in the past 30 days. So 90% of respondents in, in Kenya report using a mobile money transfer. We're at 16% on, on average in the other uh, 10 sub-Saharan countries, uh, including Uganda and Tanzania. Um, so to conclude, um, the complete database is available on our website to download. 
um, including uh, plus additional reports, some of which we have outside, and we welcome your use of the data. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. We're gonna go straight into Q&A. Um, so panelists, you wanna just come on up and sit down? And who's this, is that yours? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. Thank you to all of the presenters for a very insightful last hour. From the perspective of a donor that would really like to contribute to financial deepening in Kenya, this has been particularly useful. If our approach is to be data-driven, we really need to rely on the work of partners such as yourselves. So thank you for, for the industry goods that you're providing. Um, so we'll spend the next few minutes um, reflecting on the data presented, and then we'll open it up to um, the audience for, for Q&A, so for you in the room and for those of you that are listening online as well. Um, so maybe, Billy, if you would like to um, help get us started um, by providing your perspective on um, the information that was shared and just really talking about how it resonates with your own research in, in Kenya and what, what you found surprising. Is this on? <laughs> Not sure. Yeah. Yeah. It is, okay, good, thanks. Uh, thanks. And I like um, putting people on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> she told me ahead of time, I'm gonna put you on the spot, and that was it. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, something that's uh, maybe not surprising but gratifying is that our data is somewhat consistent with uh, <laughs> other data that was presented, though, which is good. Uh, I think there's a big difference between the kind of data I've collected or have been involved in collecting and the somewhat more ambitious data uh, projects that have been presented here. Uh, Collecting data for the whole world is just uh, <laughs> unfathomable, and I, I, I really, you know, salute the people who have the chutzpah to, to try. Uh, <laughs> I, I think it's important because it's important in one respect, and it also, I think, begs a question in the other respect. You know, the the technology we have these days for for creating these maps and these visuals, etc., is really wonderful. It helps us see what's going on. I think the next important question is, so what do we do with that, right? We see that Kenya is way ahead, or way different at least, to a lot of other countries. What now? Right. So I think uh, maybe the best thing about this data is that it helps us then start thinking more critically about uh, what, how these things have happened, what the differences are between countries, and where those differences uh, have, have grown from and what that means for policy or for private sector involvement, uh, whatever. Um, so I, I see the data as being a really welcome uh, a contribution to allowing us to look at the world, and I think we then need to think about the world and how it can be better. So uh, it's a great first step. Great, and that's actually a perfect segue to um, this next question on how to make this data actionable. Um, so I guess this, this goes to all of the panelists. Um, how do you envision your data being used by different stakeholder groups? So by, by whom and, and to what end? And, and Leora, would you like to start? Uh, sure. Um, so there are different uses of our data. Certainly policymakers, we've already heard that from Egypt to Mexico to the US, um, yeah, our data encourages policymakers to sit up and say, hey, I didn't see those gaps the gap in financial inclusion, the gap in gender, the gap in between the rich and the poor. For example, even in the U.S., we found, find that the lowest 20% of earners um, have the lowest uh, account penetration after Italy in the developed world. Um, and this is a persistent gap that's also was highlighted in an earlier FDIC report, for example. And so we, you know, hopefully this will encourage policymakers to take action. And also I should mention that the data will be collected uh, the complete database triannually and the two headline indicators on the percentage of bank penetration and percentage of current credit, which I didn't have a chance to discuss, will be collected annually um, for at least the next nine years. And so over time, we can start looking at um, the impact of reforms and benchmarking um, changes uh, in inclusion going forward. 
Um, our data also should, will hopefully be useful to practitioners. Um, we're identifying missing markets. It's not enough, perhaps, for the government to go after these gaps, but also for the private sector to identify where there are gaps and where there may be market potential. People who are able to commit to regular savings, people who are using informal credit. Um, we also, our data highlights not only the use of formal products, but also informal products. Um, and finally, um, I know researchers are very excited in October, we'll be releasing the complete micro database of 150,000 observations, and hopeful, hope that will be helpful for the uh, research community as well. Thanks, Scott. Um, <clears throat> Well, let me give two kind of answers to this. So one is we're not a policy shop. I mean, we're a data um, shop, basically. And so one of the um, uses of this data, so to speak, would be for the, I think, data community um, itself. So what we want is by pushing the envelope on, on using and making data publicly accessible to um, have others make other data available and so to try and um, lead towards this not being something where Kenya is an isolate uh, globally, but that it's, uh, you can see this same type of information on other markets. And I think we're generally confident that there is use for that data, but that's, I think, one use of these types of exercises is by getting others to adopt the same good practices. This is, again, another area where Kenya is really um, at the leading edge of the developing world because the government has this Open Data Kenya initiative where they have um, a, an incredible uh, wealth of information on Kenya, publicly accessible, very easy to access and use. Um, it does not include a lot of data or any data um, on financial services, and so that's something where there's uh, maybe a little bit of a gap, but overall um, they're really far ahead of other countries in the region and the world. And so that's, that's one use, I think, of data is to produce more data. Um, for actual use of the data, not just within the sort of data um, community. Uh, I, we have, I think, the same type of segmentation that uh, Leora described and I think that we all sort of informally talked about earlier. So we see, uh, you know, there's policymakers who could use this to inform decision making about policy. There's donors um, and investors who could use this to um, determine, to help inform their allocation of resources. Should I be looking at rural areas? Should I be looking at urban areas? Should I be looking at country X, Y, or Z? Should I be looking at this type of service? So I think that um, overall can help the allocation of resources. I, I think the ultimate um, productive use of this is really at the operator level, but that's the one where there's the longest time horizon. So we're, um, I think, starting and getting there, but that's a, that's a long road to tread. Um, speaking from experience, you know, we've, we've worked on that for the microfinance sector for the past um, decade or so, and it's, you know, uh, it was very challenging 10 years ago. There's limited transparency. People are very uncomfortable sharing information. But the, gradually that grew over time, and having people who are leaders in the industry helped um, create sort of better practices around sharing data. Um, and now it's actually fairly um, easy to access a pretty broad range of information on that. And because of that fact, it's also used at the operator level for business decision making for practitioners. Um, so I think that's there on the horizon. I, I suspect we're not really there yet for financial inclusion data. Um, but starting with the policymaker, starting with the donor conversation is probably the first step in that process. Uh, yeah, and I think that uh, when you're responding to how to make data <clears throat> actual, one of the first questions you should ask is around uh, who's the end user of the data. And some of the early users that we've seen of our data have been financial institutions on the ground who are interested in just learning from other markets. Uh, so institutions in the Philippines who uh, are looking at data from products in Kenya and just trying to spark ideas and uh, you know, see what's going on in a different market that they hear is really innovative in the space. Um, I think another area that uh, we've tried to focus on, and I know Mixed Market has as well, around creating actionable data is around visualizations. Uh, so, you know, creating on, a, on the Spinnaker website, we have product comparisons, we have, you know, graphs, we have even a couple maps to try to really dig into and so users can find their own data. And I think the last point that, uh, that Scott was touching on a little and something that we've even seen uh, in, as a promising trend in Kenya is this this opening up of data, and so looking at some of the, uh, the you know, it, whether it be an API or whether that be, um, you know, just having a downloadable um, button on your website, or, but really freeing up that data beyond PDFs is, uh, is a great way where, you know, new, new people and new users can find uh, stories that you haven't seen in the data necessarily. Great, and indeed, we at the Gates Foundation are very much using your data to inform our grant making as well as for regulatory and commercial advocacy purposes. So it is being put to good use, I can assure you, at least from our end. Um, so one last question for me before I open it up to the audience. Um, what are the major data gaps 
that you see um, in tracking progress towards financial inclusion in, in Kenya? And, and yes, I am asking for advice on what um, major efforts we should be looking out for um, in the donor community. Um, sure, whoever. B Billy, would you like to start? So I, I'll actually leave it to the professional data gatherers, I think, to, to address what gaps in data you're looking for. But maybe I could suggest uh, gaps in uh, issues that need to be addressed with the use of data. So what can we do to make people's lives better? What financial innovations can improve the lives of people? They might not. They, those, those might not exist at the moment. These innovations. Uh, so we'll, I think we need to look at creative solutions that use the new technologies that we have at hand to improve people's lives. Let me give you as an example that that water uh, payment example I mentioned quickly. Uh, so <coughs> we've known for for years how to get water out of the ground, and donors have built thousands of these pumps all over the world, millions, and they all fall into disrepair very quickly. So, and one of the reasons is, so that speaks to some kind of lack of capacity for communities to invest in and maintain and finance local public goods of some kind. I see mobile money as being a way of empowering those communities to uh, solve that coordination problem or that collective action problem. And so I guess that's one example where financial innovation can it be used to solve a, a long-standing problem that is really boring, like water, getting water out of the ground. We, we kind of thought we knew how to do that. But I think uh, the problems that resolve, uh, revolve around that issue uh, might actually be at heart financial problems. And so those kind of financial in innovations, I think, would be interesting to um, investigate further. Uh, it's not so much a data problem as a kind of uh, use to which this technology can be put. Great. Leora. Um, so something I, I, didn't have a, I didn't present um, was we also ask those who are unbanked for the reasons why they don't have an account. And so the most commonly reported reasons are the cost, distance, and documentation, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, as well as in Kenya. Um, and so certainly this highlights you know, the, the promise of these new products, processes, and technology like banking agents, like mobile banking, that seems to have transformed the financial sector landscape in Kenya. Um, but something we don't have data on is actual costs. So for example, what is the cost? I mean, so for example, for MPESA, we now have some information, but what is the cost of the alternatives? What is the cost of sending money through a bank, through Western Union? Um, and, and so better costs level cost data um, and all sorts of transactions, both formal and semi-formal and informal, I think would be quite helpful. Great. Scott? Uh, this is right in our wheelhouse because I get to complain about other people's data. Um, so I'm <laughs> <coughs> this is uh, very satisfying personally for me. Um, the uh, I, I, There's a couple of different places that we saw gaps for Kenya um, across the board, and this is not only true for Kenya. The one thing that's um, an issue is uh, either standardization or data quality. Um, so data that people are releasing is, um, as, as Eric alluded to, often in PDF formats or sort of unusable um, for digital um, work. Uh, the data is not standardized. That basic things like uh, having the addresses parsed into usable fields are not done. These are th I mean, sort of technical concerns, but when you are dealing with large volumes of information, they're meaningful. Um, that's true for pretty much everybody. And it, it's a hindrance to trying to do um, anything on this front. It's not the worst problem in the world, um, but it's there. Um, three things that are sort of um, somewhat specific to, to Kenya. Um, the first, I'll, I'll kind of pick on um, them because they're the light in a lot of these presentations, but the data from Safaricom is not uh, particularly useful. So they have um, very high level information on the number of agents and branches, but anything more detailed is not um, of a quality that I think is going to make decision making um, at a granular level helpful. So they released, they have 35,000 agents now, uh, anyway, north of um, 20,000 easily. They have a listing of 17,000 agents on their site as the best location information for their customers. Uh, we know for things like banks and for bank branches, the central bank 
uh, of Kenya was able to pull levers on banks to get good information on the bank branches. I'm not sure who pulls the lever on Safaricom uh, or other mobile providers globally to provide sort of better quality granular information. So that's a gap um, because they have such a huge role in the sector uh, and the, the rapid growth in the footprint. So that's something where better data would be, I, I think, useful. Um, you shouldn't have to knock on their door to get it. Um, data on the informal sector, and, and Luro talked about this a little bit, uh, savings groups, that's a, a data set that, that we're hoping to be able to include in this mapping effort, and it's taking, you know, um, uh, a little bit longer than we could do to show that today, but uh, that I think should be there, um, having that globally, uh, being able to validate questions about whether they're really serving underserved areas, whether they're working in rural areas or, or places that banks won't or can't go, um, that's something that would be um, useful to, to validate better information on that sector. Um, I, I think it's there, it just needs to kind of get brought to the public. Um, and then the other piece is the part that isn't measured, um, and that's doing this across countries. We saw some good information in other countries. Um, in South Africa, uh, we pulled data. They have a, a regulator that's very comprehensive in covering credit providers, and so we got data on 20 to 30,000 um, credit providers in South Africa. Um, this include this is all non-bank, so this includes payday lenders, it includes pawn shops, it includes auto uh, people providing vehicle finance. So this is all the suite of financial services that the poor and the affluent and the middle income encounter in their day-to-day -day lives, and it's outside the lens of regulators in most markets, um, but it is there on the ground, and so this is part of the the fabric of people's lives. If you go into, um, you know, parts of D.C., you'll see payday lenders and check cashing joints. Uh, well, I don't know if check either of those are legal in the district, but um, you get the point. They're there, uh, and we don't have great data on that in most markets. So I think we're fortunate we were able to see that in South Africa. Uh, I know that's there in other countries, but I don't know where you get the data for that. Great, thanks. Um, before launching the uh, Spinnaker project, we uh, took a look at this question pretty closely and conducted a landscape of where all the data existed. And uh, two of the players in this space were, were pretty much really pioneers in this space. And when it came to product level data, uh, they're pretty much, what we noticed is that there's very little data being collected. And in many ways, some of the different research initiatives that we've we've done in Philippines and Kenya are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, and, and these are just trying to build the foundation of what um, is, is a really open space and, a, and a definitely a data gap that uh, we've seen not only in this uh, initial landscape study, but uh, continuing in a number of different areas. And I think another really interesting question uh, when, when we're talking about research gaps comes around uh, data collection sustainability and how do you um, make sure that the data is up to date in many respects. And, um, and I think that, you know, a lot of times, as Scott was saying, data exists in these walled-off gardens. And not only do they exist in walled-off gardens, but very quickly uh, these issues of data integrity and how up-to-date the information is can, can really mean, uh, can really make a difference. And so, uh, you know, we've been trying to create a community around of our data to make sure that they're, you know, see the value proposition in updating their data. But it's a, you know, it's a, it's a challenge and it's something that we're, uh, we're continuing to take a look at. Great, thanks everyone. So anyone from the audience have a question for the panelists? Yes, and please introduce yourself into the microphone. Yeah. My name's Li Yang. Uh, from the most basic question is, how reliable is the data? You know, and I want you to use an American system as a comparison. You can see Occupy Wall Street. You can see people lost their home, lost their assets, they lost their account. So if you don't have this vision, how do you want the, the owner of the asset to accumulate their saving and put it into account? Or they would rather say, just consume more or put the money just uh, under the mattress. Absolutely. Um. Yeah, I think this, this issue of data integrity is something that uh, is really important. Um, and one of the ways that we've just tried to address this issue is just being as transparent as possible. So uh, a lot of times, as I was saying before, the data, you know, the timeliness of the data can be really 
uh, important. And so just on, on the Spinnaker website, we've tried to mention, you know, this data was collected at, on this date. Um, this date, you know, sourcing the data as much as possible. Um, you know, so we're pulling and we're compiling and we're mashing up data from the World Bank's indicators and just being really uh, transparent about the caveats because I think you're right. Um, you know, we, you know, there are, uh, you know, as, as we've seen with the Rosca accounts, um, we don't want to, uh, you know, try to profile an institution that doesn't have merit and is not really looking at their data as well. I'm a retired commercial banker, and uh, I want to congratulate you on uh, the data that you've gathered. I think that's going to be very, very helpful going forward um, for, as was mentioned, for change of policy in Kenya and elsewhere. And I think Kenya is, an, is, a, is sort of the example, and everybody focusing on that is a good idea because what's done in Kenya can be duplicated elsewhere. If I may, I have uh, just two questions. They're, they're kind of nuts and bolts questions from a commercial banker on uh, where all this is going. Um, if you look at the effect of Empresa on uh, the economy there, and also their new instrument, which I think is called MCASIA, which is a savings inst uh, instrument, the M-Pesa has a limitation on how much people can put into that account. The m is basically a telephone or a mobile saving mechanism, which is a, a new invention. Then we also see from the marvelous uh, statistics that you uh, showed us the incredible expansion of the commercial banking system in Kenya. And you can go into small towns in Kenya and you will find branches of the particularly those three leading banks that were uh, mentioned in that, in that survey. Um, you look at all of that and I, I wonder what the effect of that easy access to banking is going to do to the funding of uh, MFIs and co-ops. Will they be losing their funding base? Will that funding base shift into the commercial banks and into the telephone companies which have to hold that money in commercial banks? Or, and will they be welcomed in the interbank community to borrow from that or will they have to b borrow from banks as a, as a customer? These are some questions I'm really very curious about. Then I have another question which I guess is uh, more to Leora uh, Clapper. Um, when you go around into Kenya, into uh, smaller towns, and you see the banking activities there, and you talk to the managers, and they show you their por a loan portfolio and their savings and everything else, that you find that um, the savings uh, amount, what they're listed as their liabilities, and their assets are quite unbalanced. They're they are lending very little to the small towns. Most of that money, they're quite happy to say, is going back into Nairobi. So, and if you look at the, the uh, last year's uh, report from the Central Bank of Kenya, the highest area of lending was in real estate. Now we know that's not going into uh, rural areas or into agriculture. Uh, does the central bank have a role here to put, into thing, put in something like what we have in the United States of a Community Reinvestment Act, that if you're pulling deposits out of a community, isn't there an obligation to relend it back into those communities? Uh, appreciate your views on those things. Who wants to go first? <laughs> I can quickly touch on uh, your, your question and your point about MKESHO. Uh, in the report we launched today uh, that's outside, uh, we have actually have a case study on MKESHA in the partnership between Equity Bank and MPESA, and I think it's a really uh, unique and innovative product um, that has gained a lot of steam. And so as, as the gentleman was mentioning, uh, it's a savings product that's fully integrated on a mobile phone platform. And, uh, and actually, the, the growth of it has been pretty, um, pretty rapid. And so it's just something to take another look at. Uh, I know there's a number of other questions, but I'll let the other panelists handle those. Uh, 
Uh, so I, I actually disagree a little bit. I, I think despite the similarity of names, which is a <coughs> bit of a marketing uh, coup, uh, the MCOSHA has been much less uh, successful than M-PESA. Uh, M-PESA has uh, currently about 18 million, uh, something like that, accounts, and m Kesho is probably around one, I think. One million. Uh, it's a more complicated account than, but there were issues with communication between the bank and the and the telephone company. Issues uh, is on the record, right? Uh, <laughs> issues about co uh, bringing two big elephants together to dan dance in a small room, shall we say? Uh, so I, it's good though because you know this is the private sector at work, and it doesn't often work in Africa. And so uh, I think you know this collaboration was a, a, a useful thing to try out. But there are lots of other banks and, and telephone companies to, to try as well. Um, I, I think your issue, about your question about the basically financial financial intermediation, but you know taking deposits from from savers and and giving them to investors is a really good one. Uh, I've found in my experience that you know banks, equity bank <laughs> seems very. Uh, willing to take deposits, it doesn't seem willing to lend to anyone. It just buys treasury bills, kind of thing. Uh, I don't know the data to back that up, but my kind of impression is that a lot of the the bank deposits are being tra channeled into T bills, basically, and then from that, you know, th uh, to the rest of the country. Should there be an inst a, a law that says they have to go back to the rural areas, or should there be more accountability or more political representation that says, you know, if the government is getting this money to finance a deficit or to finance public spending, maybe the government should be spending money in, in those communities on local in infrastructure, etc. Uh, that's a difficult question. Leora probably can answer it better. Um, I, I actually will will pass on the last <laughs> question. Yeah, but we'll comment that you know there's supportive evidence by. Yeah, colleagues, um, like Pascaline Dupas and Jonathan Robinson in Kenya, just showing this huge craving and demand for safe savings products. Um, and uh, you know, they've shown just offering people, they offering, uh, they, they offered uh, adults a savings account for getting, um, some entrepreneurs, um, and take up was very high, particularly by women, particularly by women who are often forced into involuntary loans to family and friends, um, and found that allowing them account a safe place secure place to keep their money, increase their investments in their companies as well as the profitability. Um, and so I, you know, certainly all of these efforts to um, promote safe places for people to store their money is a important step in the right direction. Do we have time for one more question, Jamie? Yes. Oh. I'm Pamela Tan, I work on the domestic side of the asset building program. And I actually had a question um, about whether or not there's any uh, movements across the world to have data accessible for consumers to make decisions. That's something that's been going on in the US, because um, most of the data that you guys are talking about were on the supply side. And so I was wondering if there are any other kind of um, data collection issues to address supply or demand side issues. I should have probably included that in the spectrum of people that would be under consideration, but I think for working a lot in the developing world, it's sort of so far off on the horizon, but that should be sort of the end point of this. So you have, you know, high-level policymakers, you have donors and investors, then you can move to operators and practitioners, but what you really ultimately want is information that's useful for customers or consumers to make to financial decisions uh, for themselves. I think that's pretty far off in the future, but uh, I would see a lot of the information that, uh, you know, as an American using financial services in the United States that I have um, accessible to me um, is not uh, crazy to think would be available um, in the developing world for consumers. It's, uh, there's questions about, I guess, financial capability and education and, and then the channels through which people would access that, but um, um, that's there. I, I can say one of the pieces of information that, that we've leveraged for the mapping in which I'm um, pretty enthusiastic is is a realistic path is using the um, information that banks uh, and other financial institutions make available for their customers. So South Africa is a pretty developed and banked financial sector, and we used um, the branch listings that they made available for their customers. So just what the you would go onto, you know, Absa Bank in South Africa and say, where's the nearest branch? And they would click on something and say, well, here it is. It's next to this supermarket downtown. And so that's what we utilize exactly the same information um, for our mapping. But they needed to do that because their customers want and need that information 
uh, for themselves. So to the extent that that channel from the institution to their customers um, relies on data and data that's publicly accessible and, and in a usable format, then I think some of this can just sort of sit back on top of it. But I, that's um, uh, a, a yeah, fantastic point to make that really the, the point of all of this is that eventually customers have either better options or the information to make better decisions for themselves. Great, and are there any questions from our um, web audience? I think there were a couple, but in, for the sake of time, I thought one of the most interesting was um, about the data on cross-border economic corridors, the questions about that, if markets that are not defined by national boundaries and, and the role that might play in some of these markets and, and some of the products that are being accessed. I don't know, like, anyone who would want to. I think there's a lot of evidence that M-Pesa was used in yeah. South Sudan, Somalia, um, Uganda, over the border. Um, is that a good thing? Um, <laughs> you can't stop it. <laughs> you can't build a wall that high. Um, but the impact, I'm not sure. It's hard, it's hard to say what the impact is. Yeah, actually, yeah, some, and again, this is, you know, I think there's a lot of anecdotal uh, rumors floating around, but no hard data on that. Um, but certainly something we pick up, which was quite surprising, is, and there's a nice map in the report, on the mobile banking penetration in other countries in Africa, for example, in Somalia lands, we find a very high rate. Um, and, and a number of other countries where we went back and there was no provider providing a formal service. And so at first we got, you know, nervous about the quality of the data. Um, and Gallup actually went back and did focus groups in some of, the, some of these countries. Um, and it seemed that there's a very active, vibrant, completely informal market of sending minutes. I mean, from both remittances, but also, you know, employers saying that they pay their workers in the next village by sending them minutes. And that's how, you know, formalized this informal market has been. Um, and I think this is something that policymakers um, and private sectors should, should be aware of. Um, and hopefully our data um, shines a light on. One, this doesn't fully answer the question, but one thread that might be relevant for it is the, um, the sort of the rise of the regional banking networks in sub-Saharan Africa. So there's a lot of um, <coughs> cross-country banks uh, that have, you know, a holding company and subsidiaries. So Equity Bank has, um, I forget, Rwanda, South Sudan, they have affiliates in other countries, EcoBank, um, Bank. Bank of America. Yeah, they all have affiliates across country. It's not exactly, I think, what the um, um, questioner is getting at about cross borders, but that's something that I think would be important to the extent that there's multinational um, institutions uh, providing services in different countries. That's both a you know a challenge opportunity for um, looking at this. I'm looking at you, but this is a person in cyberspace. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Great, and I'll overstep my role as moderator to share that M-Pesa does have a partnership with Western Union, so um, people in the UK, for example, can send money to M-Pesa users in, in Kenya. Um, so there are formal established channels for cross-border remittances that leverage the, the mobile money distribution network. Um, and I think with that, we may not have any more time for questions, so I will um, hand it over to Jamie for closing remarks, and also so that I am not the person keeping you from beer and wine but I'm um, looking forward to continuing the conversation later. Okay, and I don't want to be the person who stands between beer or wine either, um, so I'd just like to take an opportunity to thank um, all of our panelists and um, our moderator for um, today's discussion. I know that there was a list of some six or seven questions over um, Twitter, and I know others who had their hands up that weren't able to ask questions. Those of you who have questions, please stick around. Um, if you want, have a drink. Um, and chat. Uh, for those uh, that asked questions over Twitter, I wonder if we might be able to um, continue this conversation perhaps in uh, the form of some sort of blog post where um, the panelists have an opportunity to reflect on some of the questions uh, that have come up and um, you know just continue that conversation uh, a little bit more if possible. So I'll uh, follow up with all of you on that. Um, so thanks again. Um, I, everybody, please uh, join me in thanking the panelists. Um, and then let's have a drink. Thank you.